Today, fingerprinting is still one of the go-to methods law enforcement uses to identify suspects in their investigations. And prior to the mass adoption of DNA analysis, it was one of the strongest forms of evidence police could use to convict criminals. As recent as many of these developments have been, however, humanity's interest in fingerprints goes back way further, thousands of years, in fact, back to ancient civilizations in China, Babylon, and Japan. Though truly understanding them would take an incredibly long time, through diligent study, we would eventually find one of the most powerful tools in the forensic science toolkit. Though in practice, it may not be as perfect as it initially seems. This is Learn Something New. The earliest fingerprints found date back thousands of years, back to ancient civilizations in China and Babylon. These ancient empires used fingerprints to identify people mainly for business contracts, tying each person to the contracts they agreed to with what was, at the time, an unforgeable form of identification. Over in Europe, and almost 3,000 years later, several scientists sparked a fascination into the different types of fingerprints, how they resembled one another, but each with their own distinct designs. As the Enlightenment was kicking off in Europe, scientists began to really dive deep into the study of the human body. One of these scientists, Dr. Nehemiah Gru, was studying the epidermal layer of the body, aka he was reporting on his observations of human skin. Dr. Gru reported finding ridged skin across each human's fingertips. Although this was intriguing, it wasn't widely viewed as an area of study that should be prioritized. Though, in the following years, other scientists also began to study this phenomena, yet the findings remained fairly surface level. But, this may have been due to the limitations in the technology of their time. Because once a prominent Italian doctor named Marcello Malpighi got access to an early version of the microscope, he was able to observe fingerprints in detail like never before. Marcello Malpighi was something of a renaissance man in the field of medicine throughout his career in the late 1600s. He first described pulmonary capillaries and alveoli, two integral parts of the lungs that help facilitate the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of the body's blood supply. He also discovered and described renal glomeruli, clumps of blood vessels in the kidneys that work to filter waste materials from the body's blood. Not satisfied with just studying humans, Malpighi also dedicated himself to extensive studies of insects and botanical life, observing organisms at a level of detail so tiny it would have been nearly impossible to understand without the use of the early microscope. It was with this revolutionary tool of science, then, that he was able to analyze fingerprints in much greater detail, discovering that the patterns forming ridges across the skin helped increase friction when coming into contact with the surface, allowing people to more easily pick up objects with their hands and keep traction on their feet when walking barefoot. These discoveries and descriptions of fingerprints resulted in the stratum Malpighi layer of skin, the innermost layer of skin, to be named in Malpighi's honor. Yet, even Malpighi failed to realize, or acknowledge, the unique qualities each fingerprint had to each individual. Although his results led to more scientists becoming intrigued by fingerprints, increasing the amount they were studied, it would be around 150 years later before fingerprints started to be widely recognized as unique to each individual. Though surprisingly, this discovery wouldn't come from any scientist. During the British colonization of India, specifically in the year 1858, the British administrator for the East India Company, Sir William James Herschel, instructed that contracts with local businessmen be signed with a handprint. You see, Herschel had become fascinated with the intricate designs and patterns created from applying ink to one's hand and then pressing them into paper. He was so captivated by each individual handprint he saw that he began to print his own as well as taking fingerprints from family and friends, leading him to come to the conclusion that fingerprints don't change as people age. This gave him enough confidence to start using handprints, then eventually just fingerprints, on everything during his work in India. Everything from pensions to jail warrants, mainly serving as a means of preventing fraud. And he tried his best to let the world know about his discoveries, despite not being a true scientist himself. He would go on to publish prints he had done of his own hands from the year 1859 through 1916 to demonstrate their permanence. As his reports went out into the world, others were discovering the same thing. 
Henry Falds is known as one of the fathers of dactyloscopy, the study of fingerprints for the purpose of identification. In the 1870s, Falds was on a mission to establish modernized medical practices in Japan. His interest in fingerprints was first piqued when he was working alongside an American archaeologist in Japan after he found ancient pieces of clay that had been imprinted with unique markings. While not working on the hospital he had established for Tokyo, he was studying the fingerprints extensively, even fingerprinting staff around the hospital to get a larger sample to study from. He would send his work to famed scientist Charles Darwin, hoping to have him help advance the study of fingerprinting. Yet, at this point, Darwin was less than two years from his death, and found himself so sick that he couldn't be of any help, choosing instead to pass the work on to another scientist, Sir Francis Galton. Sir Francis Galton took the idea of fingerprinting and ran with it, publishing his book Fingerprints in 1892, which established that fingerprints were formed prior to birth and persisted throughout one's life. He also identified further details in fingerprints, like uniting or dividing ridges on fingerprints, now referred to as Galton details. Now, at this point in the late 1880s, law enforcement around the globe were developing anthropometric systems for classifying criminals, taking body measurements, and photographing from the front and right side profiles. With the publishing of Galton's book, it seemed like fingerprints were the perfect tool to add to law enforcement's toolkit. All this research would come to a head in 1892, the same year Galton's book was published, when two children were found murdered in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Their mother, also injured from the attack, accused a local man of the crime because she had refused to marry him. However, when the detective Eduardo Alvarez began inspecting the crime scene further, he found a bloody thumbprint on the door. Taking the print, he presented it to the mother, matching it to hers, and she immediately confessed to taking the lives of her own children, making this the very first crime to be solved using fingerprint identification. Within a decade, many countries around the world had adopted fingerprinting as a means of forensic crime scene analysis. The United States started its fingerprinting in 1902, at first just within the police department of New York City, but it wouldn't take long for it to rapidly expand. Today, the integrated automated fingerprint identification system maintained by the FBI contains millions of fingerprints, though this doesn't just include the fingerprints of people arrested for alleged crimes. The IAFIS also stores fingerprints from people getting licenses to practice in certain industries, real estate, finance, certain law enforcement officers, etc. But although throughout most of their histories used in the legal system, fingerprints have been seen as absolute and incontrovertible proof, they aren't without their flaws. Fingerprints rely on examiners to check two samples against each other, and sometimes fingerprints pulled from crime scenes aren't able to be perfectly captured, with most only consisting of about 20% of the total print, and oftentimes smudged on a surface. So the examiners have to come to a statistically likely conclusion as to whether the partial print and the print of the alleged match up. And a way to combat errors in this field was often to have someone check the work of a fingerprint examiner, but one study found that if a supervisor made the initial examination, those ranked lower would often feel pressured to agree with the conclusion, even if they felt otherwise. That being said, fingerprinting has been massively relied upon since that first murder case in 1892 for a reason. Although it's not perfect, the error rate tends to be quite low, and when combined with other evidence, it has historically proven to be extremely helpful in delivering justice. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. Please consider giving the video a like as it lets me know you found this video interesting. I'd like to give a special thanks to the channel's patrons who really help keep this channel going, and for all the viewers who keep coming back every week to learn something new. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.